All right. Uh, so thanks uh, to the organizers for inviting me to be here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about a paper that I wrote with Tom Banks last fall. Um, in some sense, this is a paper that's on a very old subject, and it's one that physicists understand very well. Uh, but it's also a subject that I think is not justified all that carefully. Um, and so I'm going to try to fix that, at least to some extent. All right. So we're all taught uh, in you know, the first statistical mechanics course that systems with a large number of degrees of freedom exhibit sort of universal phenomena independent of microscopic detail. Uh, so, for example, we organize theories by their universality class for understanding properties of the ground state. This has been a very successful program in understanding statistical mechanics over the past century. Uh, I mean, even more elementary, we just have thermodynamic methods to help us sort of characterize many body systems in terms of measurable uh, objects. And what I'm interested in today is not the sort of universality classes of zero temperature behavior uh, in quantum systems, but the dynamics and, and universality class in some sense of uh, finite temperature quantum systems. And the lore is that the universal effective description for finite temperature uh, ergodic quantum systems is a theory called hydrodynamics. Okay. And this is something that we're all very familiar with. You know, uh, it's how airplanes fly, uh, that we understand hydrodynamics. And the equations of hydrodynamics are, are sort of deceptively simple. They're classical partial differential equations. And the goal of this talk is to give some intuition for how these equations are secretly contained uh, in the Schrodinger equation. All right. Uh, so first, let me just quickly sort of recap, uh, maybe it was unnecessary here, but, but uh, recap what hydrodynamics is. So a simple cartoon is the following. Uh, I'm going to give you these two uh, sets of billiard balls, you know, the same geometry, uh, but different initial conditions. And the question is, you know, suppose I, I wait some long amount of time, uh, and I, you know, given these initial conditions, I, I just let time evolve. So these billiard balls will move according to Newton's laws, and uh, can I distinguish these apart? And in general, the answer is no, because this is a chaotic system. If I put, put this on my laptop, I'll start accumulating computational errors. If I do this in a lab, you know, I won't be able to perfectly, uh, there will be some, you know, setup error in my experiment. And so eventually, these systems are, for all practical purposes, identical, even though they started off with different initial conditions. And so now I can repeat the experiment uh, but with these uh, collections of billiard balls instead. And now I ask, you know, can I distinguish these uh, collections of billiard balls after some amount of time? And this one is very easy. I can do this for any amount of time because I just have to count how many billiards there are. Okay. So this one has one fewer ball than, than the right one. And as a consequence, it's very easy to understand uh, the late time dynamics. Okay, so with this sort of, you know, stupid cartoon as a, as a guide, uh, the lore of hydrodynamics is that the slow degrees of freedom will be associated with locally quantities, okay? So this is in some sense an ansatz uh, about what hydrodynamics will look like. And I'm not going to consider cases where there's spontaneous symmetry breaking, topological defects. You, you can deal with all of this, but it's just an unnecessary complication for today. Okay. And of course, in the billiard ball example, just to be a bit pedantic, uh, the, the natural conservation law that we can think about, or one of them, uh, would just be the density of, of our billiard ball. Okay. And so it's sort of natural to guess that the equation of motion of this hydrodynamic theory would be sort of the one thing that we know for sure holds about this system. Namely, we have a local conservation law, and this is associated with an exact ward identity. Uh, so even in quantum mechanics, this is an exact equation uh, as an operator statement. 
Now, of course, we want to you know, go from a sort of empty operator statement that's true but, but not useful into something that we can actually predict with. And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to say that, well, you know, the, the current is not a conserved object itself, and it's not one of our hydrodynamic degrees of freedom, so we should, re so we should rewrite the current in terms of our hydrodynamic degrees of freedom. And because the current comes with an extra index, we have to start adding derivatives to the density. Okay. And so we write the current as a gradient expansion of the density. Essentially, this will be a Taylor series in derivatives. This is an asymptotic series in general, but that doesn't mean it's not useful. The leading order term in this series is, in this particular example, given by a single uh, diffusion constant multiplied by the gradient of, of the density in space. I'm going to assume, uh, for the sake of argument, that this was the only conservation law in my system. And if I combine these two equations together, I predict that on long time and length scales, the dynamics is completely universal and is governed by uh, the classical diffusion equation. Okay? Now, important to keep in mind here is that we're looking on very long time and length scales. There are many degrees of freedom you know, in each of our um, cells of size x. And so we don't want to think about this as a quantum equation anymore. Okay? We'd like to say that this equation has become classical. So we can treat rho as a classical degree of freedom and solve this partial differential equation you know, by hand in simple geometry. Right. Now, there are a few things that I think are unsatisfactory about this about this lore as stated. So one of them is that we have to put something in by hand that's very unnatural from an effective theory point of view, namely the second law of thermodynamics. This is an inequality, which is a little weird for an effective field theory. And it's not really, it doesn't come from you know, statements about symmetries and conservation laws. It, it comes from sort of out of left field. It's, it's a totally different concept. Right here, we're saying something about irreversibility, and this will demand, in, in this particular example, that the diffusion constant has to be non-negative. Okay. So that's a little bit odd from, from the classic you know, EFT point of view. Which equation? Oh, this is, uh, it, you can use a thermodynamic dynamic identities together with this equation to derive this. Uh, yeah. Here chi is an appropriate thermodynamic susceptibility. All right, so that's sort of one, that's one strange thing. Uh, another one is that we have to do yet another sort of ad hoc addition to the diffusion equation. We can't treat this equation as, as a sort of completely deterministic classical equation. We have to add this uh, fluctuating noise into the equation. And this is also, I think, a little bit strange, um, you know, at least as I've told you so far, where did this come from? Uh, you know, one answer would be this is some microscopic strength coming from statistical mechanics, but then the question is, well, why did we miss that, you know, if we did our effective theory properly? Now, typically, one assumes that this, uh, or that this stochastic fluctuation in the diffusion equation uh, is Gaussian white noise, and it has a special uh, variance, which is fixed by the diffusion constant in thermodynamics. Okay? But you could ask, in the same way that there are uh, lots of corrections to the diffusion equation that we've just suppressed for simplicity, uh, you know, what about this noise? Presumably, there are additional corrections here as well. Okay, so one way that you could, you could treat this problem is to just take the effective theory approach really seriously, but to, to use sort of all of the modern machinery that we have. So you use sort of the fanciest, you know, high energy physics uh, technology, schwinger keldish formalism, and in 500 pages of work, you get three totally different looking theories that somehow are supposed to contain the diffusion equation. I think they're on, I mean, I think they're correct, um, but it's a little bit opaque, okay? And the way that they recover, for example, 
fluctuation dissipation in this second law uh, is quite non-trivial. Um, okay. Now, even if you sort of believe the effective theory approach and, you know, from the EFT perspective, the problem of, of hydrodynamics is completely solved, uh, I still feel like there are some questions that, that should be a little bit unsettling. Um, so one is that in practice, this collision constant, I mean, you, it certainly can't be computed from the effective theory perspective because you need more microscopic data to, you know, this is the input into your effective theory, not the other way around. And this is a bit unfortunate because there are lots of numerical algorithms for other things that we're interested in, but the diffusion constant is particularly hard, especially if you want an unbiased you know, algorithm where you can say, I'm 100% confident that this is the diffusion constant in my system. Um, okay. Another sort of more subtle issue is that we've implicitly assumed that this density is the hydrodynamic mode and that nothing else was a hydrodynamic mode. Nothing else belongs in the effective theory. And that's, you know, a very plausible assumption. I don't know of a counterexample to it, but it's also not clear, you know, this is again input into the effective theory. So you have to go beyond this EFT approach if you want to really justify why you don't have to include any other degrees of freedom. And then there's sort of a very old question which you might also want to uh, think about again, which is if we start from, you know, a more microscopic description, like the many-body Schrodinger equation, this is a unitary equation, and if we want to understand, you know, microscopically the origin of all of this uh, hydrodynamic phenomenology, which may be necessary, you know, if you want to understand how to compute the diffusion constant accurately, for example, then you need to understand carefully how this many-body equation, which is unitary, ends up giving you dissipative classical stochastic physics. Okay. And again, you know, this is a very old problem, lots of references from 50 plus years ago. And so the purpose of this talk is to try and give at least a sort of, you know, slightly hand-wavy uh, discussion of the derivation of hydrodynamics really starting from the unitary uh, microscopic dynamics, okay? This is a very old problem. I mean, I think almost since the days that quantum mechanics was invented, people asked, can we derive hydrodynamics and classical statistical phenomena from this equation? Uh, I think that the presentation that I will give today is a little, uh, it's, it's a bit more transparent. I think the assumptions, and there will really be only some sense one or two uh, will be quite clear. So uh, hopefully you'll bear with me, even though in some sense this is a very old problem. All right. So our setup will be the following. So we want to consider a many-body quantum mechanical system on a lattice, okay? So the Hilbert space will be, you know, a tensor pro Hilbert spaces for, for each site. And let's imagine, uh, just because we can, that we group up all of the lattice sites into different regions, okay? And how we do this is arbitrary. It doesn't really matter. Uh, why we're doing this is that we want to write a local Hamiltonian on this uh, lattice graph in terms of, sort of parts of the Hamiltonian that, that act entirely within one region, which we'll denote as H of X. So here, the capital X and Y and so on will denote these um, uh, subsets. And then these orange couplings in the figure uh, correspond to boundary terms, which I'll denote as H of X, Y. Okay. And by extensivity, when I'm looking in a thermal state, or, or just more generally any highly excited state, uh, most of the energy is contained in or in the bulk terms, and the boundary terms are, are a small effect. Okay. All right. Now, uh, an assumption, or, or perhaps in some way more of a philosophical statement, is that if this is the only structure I've told you for your quantum system, and otherwise it's totally random, then you really should only be interested in correlation functions that look like this at late times. Um, now, 
I'm going to derive certain equations exactly, so to some degree this is, isn't an assumption, but you could say that you know, philosophically we're sort of aiming at hydrodynamic to begin with. Uh, but all that I'm going to try to calculate are these expectation values of the uh, local energy densities A sub S. Uh, but unlike the way we think about our classical uh, hydrodynamic equations, I'm not only interested in the average x, I want all possible correlation functions. Okay? So any power of h of x is fair game. You know, an extensive number of h of x's multiplied together is also uh, a question I would like to, or a correlator I would like to compute. Okay? But nevertheless, this is you know, a very small fraction of the information contained in my rate function. Yeah? what I'm going to do today, but there's, so at least if it's, if, if there are things like charge or spin, it would be very easy to extend what we're doing to account for this. Uh, because we're on uh, a discrete, I mean, momentum conservation isn't really allowed. So, oh yeah, so this, this is where I said, it, it sort of as a philosophical statement, I'm going to assume that the system is sufficiently randomly chosen so that I don't, you know, accidentally land on a Hamiltonian, let's say, charge conservation, that's all. But if you did land on one of those Hamiltonians, you could generalize this construction in a simple way to also include charge in, in much the same way. Okay. So our goal is only to compute these. So we could do this by solving the many-body Schrodinger equation and then calculate the exponential number of these that there are, uh, or we can try to shortcut, which is uh, how we'll proceed. So uh, a bit more notation. So we'll write uh, our vectors in Hilbert space in terms of the eigenstates of these local Hamiltonians H of X, okay? And th these are denoted as alpha. And finally, we want to work with the density matrix, not with uh, the wave function, yes? Well, so from my perspective, so this is an object that's localized on a scale of um, L, which I guess, sorry, I forgot to denote in the picture, but it's just the number of sites across, okay? And so I'm only interested in observables that are sort of smooth on the scale of L. Um, okay. So, so I have my uh, base. I'm going to compute uh, not the wave function, but the density matrix, their equivalent. Um, okay. And finally, note that if I ever write this inner product, uh, this is the same thing that we done on Tuesday afternoon, but here I'm just normalizing it as pure trace. Okay. Now, the idea is that we're going to use some tricks to isolate only the part of the density matrix that contributes to these correlation functions. So this will simplify our calculation. All right. So before we can do that, uh, the way we, we should, you know, if we evaluate in, in um, this density matrix, one of these expectation values, uh, because H of X only cares about, you know, its eigenvalues, then really all we need to know is uh, what's the probability that our wave function is inside of a given sort of window of energies? So there are a huge number of eigenstates. We bin them up into little boxes of width delta. So for every E of X, for every region that we have, we have one dimension in the space of all eigenstates. Okay. We bin them up in the sort of classic statistical mechanics fashion, and we define a particular operator uh, into each bin separately, okay? Now, a little bit of state counting from thermodynamics. These projectors are orthogonal operators and their norm is set by the density of states of the many-body system. Uh, by construction, we can write this as the exponential of the entropy and sometimes that will be a useful formula. And now the key point is that in order to measure these correlation functions, h of x, h of x squared, h of y, h of x cubed, and so on, we don't need the full density matrix. We only need the part 
that's linearly proportional to one of these projectors, okay? And so we can define a sort of super projector, which I'll call curly D, onto these operators. Now, the information that we get out is simply the classical joint probability distribution for measuring all E alphas simultaneously, okay? It's quite a big object, but also much smaller than the full many body distribution, okay? And now comes the, the key point. The many body Schrodinger equation is linear, and anytime you have a linear differential equation, okay, you can freely integrate things out exactly. And this, this, the procedure is, at least in principle, quite simple. Um, in the case of the problem that we're studying, it's even simpler than it has to be, okay, or than it is in the worst case. And what you do, uh, or what you find after a little bit of algebra, is the following equation. So the projected part of the density matrix, the evolved forward in time, knowing only the knowledge of this special subsector of the density matrix, okay, long as you start off in this special, special condition, that's easy to arrange, so uh, that's not a problem. The price that you pay, however, for integrating degrees of freedom out is that your equation of motion becomes non-local in time. And non-locality is captured by this kernel K, uh, which is called the memory function. Now, okay, there's lots of formulas, but, but intuitively what the memory function is doing is the following. So suppose for simplicity that I start in, in an eigen state of my system. So in an eigen state of all of the H of X. So then as I, as I evolve this operator in time, I'm commuting it through the Hamiltonian. And every time I commute it through one of the uh, bulk objects, one of the H of X, it just passes right through. So the only thing that can, um, that can sort of hit this and, and push it into another state is one of the boundary Hamiltonians, H of XY. Now when that happens, I can only, cha I'll change one of these two alphas into another set of eigenstates. Uh, only in the regions X and Y, I should mention. And now H of X longer commutes through this object, and so this thing will start picking up a phase. Okay? So if you like, the density matrix is picking up off-diagonal components. The full density matrix is becoming more complicated. And eventually, this dephasing object will get hit with another H of X, Y, and will bounce back into a diagonal state. So this is sort of the simplest possible thing that can happen. I get hit with two H of X, Ys, and they take me um, you know, from one diagonal state to another one. I can either turn back to where I came from or get flipped into gamma. There are many, many higher order processes, but this leading order one um, is the one that we'll focus on. Okay, so at this point comes sort of the, the main physical assumption. And this is that we want this sort of two-step process that I mentioned on the previous slide, where you go from an eigenstate, you, you sort of go into the off-diagonal space, and then get kicked uh, into another eigenstate. We, we want to approximate that this really is the dominant process that occurs uh, in the system. And the justification for this is loosely that H of X, Y was suppressed by a power of one over L. And so the more H of X and Ys we include, the more powers of one over L we pick up. Now this is not mathematically rigorous because these one over Ls are coming in this exponential, okay? And we're interested in this equality holding on time scales that are very large compared to L. And so it's a priori not uh, well justified that you can ignore the phase that, that you're accumulating. But we'll go ahead and make this assumption anyway because after this assumption is made, everything will follow So the first thing that you see is right away that this has led to the emergence of dissipation. So if you make this assumption and you're in a many-body system that's chaotic, uh, you now have a dissipative equation uh, for these diagonal elements of your density matrix. And it's deceptively simple how this happens. So this phase is integrated over all time from zero to infinity, integral pi times a delta function on energy. That imposes energy conservation, okay? And 
this first line in the approximation you can just think of as kind of the low frequency limit of the Laplace transformed equation in motion. It just zooms in on the late time behavior. Okay. And let me caution you that this assumption we trust the results that we'll end up with to leading order in 1 over L because, of course, we've dropped all of the subleading corrections. Okay. And you'll see where this comes in later. All right, so having made that, that P approximation, we can now just evaluate all the formulas we have exactly. So in particular, we can evaluate this memory function, and it, it gives a sort of embarrassingly simple result. So it turns out that this joint probability distribution uh, now with, with our approximation obeys uh, this Markov equation, okay? And the transition rates in this equation are, are just Fermi's golden rule, okay? So we're counting you know, what's the rate at which these boundary terms in the Hamiltonian can knock us in between eigenstates of, of uh, sort of bulk pieces of the Hamiltonian. Okay. And then transition rates are weighted by the density of states in each box. And um, that's very physically sensible, just keeping in mind what the equilibria should be. Okay. Now, if this was where it would be sort of unfortunate because there are many books on how to look at Markov chains. This is not an easy problem. But we can use a few more tricks. Uh, so firstly, the Hamiltonians that we're interested in are local. And this means that they're not allowed to exchange large amounts of energy in any given step. So if you commute th through the boundary Hamiltonian, each term can only add an order L to the zero constant amount of energy. There's many ways that you can add a constant amount of energy, but because you're thinking about you know, a wave function that's evolving, you commute with a large object, you just get a huge sum of terms, all of which differ um, in every single eigenstate by only a constant amount. And with this in mind, together with the extension system, you can tailor expand this equation and drop subleading corrections. So only the lowest order term and derivatives of E is important and you get this quadratic contribution at the end of the day. This sigma is, is just, re it's related to this W um, centrally integrated over all fluctuations, uh, E minus E prime squared. Okay. Now at this point, uh, in some sense we're done because we've used Schrodinger equation to get this linear equation for the disjoint probability of energies. And now you realize that this equation is nothing but the Fokker-Planck equation for a nonlinear stochastic PDE. And what is that PDE? Uh, well, it's this. I'll tell you what the noise is on the next slide. Okay. And now we want to um, think about what this object looks like. Okay, so yeah, I, I, I guess, sorry, I introduced another curly D, but okay. um, beta here is the inverse temperature set by the derivative of density of states. Okay. And this D, uh, if you think about the transition rates, they could only exchange energies between two adjacent boxes. So when you, you know, turn through the calculation, you find that the uh, transition rates essentially look like an energy dependent constant times the graph Laplacian on your sort of um, graph of all these regions. Okay. All right, so just a few more simple steps invoking thermodynamic arguments, and we arrive at the conclusion that this linear equation for uh, this joint probability that we found uh, in the continuum limit is truly equivalent to the nonlinear stochastic diffusion equation for energy. Okay? So this is, this is where energy diffusion uh, is, is contained, essentially, in the Schrodinger equation. We can also determine what this noise is because we have the full Fokker-Planck equation. And you, you can do a short calculation to convince yourself that it exactly fluctuation dissipation theorem. It's classical because this procedure only makes sense on time scales that are very long compared to h bar over kdt. Okay. And our, you know, our region size is quite big, so we're guaranteed that that time scale is irrelevant. Okay. So this is, uh, I, I think, is, is uh, 
close as at least I know how to get to a sort of first principles derivation of this equation um, from the unitary quantum dynamics. Now, we can, use, uh, we can use this derivation to clarify some of the questions that I brought up in the introduction to the talk. One of them is, for example, how do we know that this, uh, this noise in the equation isn't extremely complicated in a general system? And the answer to that is that the noise is in general not Gaussian, but non-Gaussian noise is coming from higher derivative corrections to our Fokker-Planck equation, which were all suppressed by one over L. So the only non-Gaussianity that's possible in a general hydrodynamic uh, system will come along for the ride with higher derivative corrections um, to the diffusion kernel, which we haven't kept track of. Okay. All right. So for the last part of the talk, I want to just sort of use this Fokker-Planck equation to tell you some things about hydrodynamics. Maybe they're sort of obvious to you, but, but certainly to Tom and I, uh, it was nice to see them explicitly shown. Okay, so we'll, let's start with some simple facts. Uh, so you could ask, now that we have a big equation for, for this uh, probability for measuring energies, what are the steady states? And the answer is just microcanonical ensembles or any linear superposition of them because the equation is linear. And of course, this is meant that energy is a conservation law, so not very surprising. A good superposition to think about, uh, as we'll see, will be the canonical ensemble. Not surprising again. And if the density of states is a smooth function, as it is for you know, a typical thermodynamic system at a typical temperature, and this probability distribution close to equilibrium is Gaussian. And this will mean that analyzing the fluctuations close to equilibrium is particularly simple. Okay. The variance of this by temperature times uh, thermodynamic susceptibility for energy, this is specific heat up to some power of temperature that I can't remember. All right, so the Fokker-Planck equation was linear and we can use all of our tricks for solving linear systems to analyze it. Of course, we could have equivalently analyzed the uh, stochastic equation, but for me, this is much simpler. And to analyze a linear system, it's convenient to pick a basis where the equation looks simple. Okay? The basis where the Fokker-Planck equation looks simple, close to equilibrium, is this sort of basis. So in analogy with the quantum harmonic oscillator, we're going to consider essentially the canonical equilibrium uh, our starting point, and then we will multiply it by products meet polynomials in every region. Okay. Now physically, what does this mean? Uh, as we'll see momentarily, we will interpret this polynomial as the statement that there are n hydrodynamic excitations present in that region. So in particular, we can uh, now ask, you know, if we expand our joint probability in this basis, we write down the equation of motion governing, uh, this isn't really a quantum state, but if you will, these um, you know, wave function coefficients in this probability distribution. We can ask how these uh, different states can transition into one another. The transition matrix is given by this um, K and it turns out that what the transition matrix does is quite simple. It simply takes a hydrodynamic excitation in one site and moves it into a neighboring site. The constant rate at which it does this depends on the number of excitations, you know, it just to remind you of bosonic systems. Uh, and yeah. But the punchline is just that, you know, these hydrodynamic modes just hop around in, in an extremely simple fashion. Okay. Close to equilibrium. Now, one thing which you might find slightly puzzling is that uh, this Markov process actually has an infinite number of conservation laws, okay? And you should recognize this as the statement that energy is conserved on every microcanonical shell in the canonical ensemble. So even when we write down a single noisy diffusion equation, there actually are an infinite number of conservation laws contained within it. 
they're, they're all related, so maybe that's, that wording is a little bit annoying, but just be, just be aware of this fact. All right, so we can now analyze this uh, Fokker-Planck equation one sector at a time near equilibrium. The zero excitation sector is, of course, trivial, so we'll start adding a single excitation. The physical interpretation of this excitation is that if you were to take this state and ask what is the average value of H of X, you would find that it was E bar, whatever the thermal uh, energy per, per region is, except for on whatever site your excitation lives on. Okay? How much you deviate from, from this is then proportional to however the weight, however large the weight of your state is. Now, this thing just, you know, pops around like a random walker on this lattice. Oh, so just as in, you know, classical uh, 1D quantum mechanics, you can diagonalize your hopping matrix and you can, uh, and you can understand the time evolution of this Markov equation. In the long wavelength limit, you find a continuum diffusion equation. And if you've kept track of where all of these factors of L are, so recall that L was sort of our, our UV cutoff in some sense. It was the length scale at which we just threw everything together and said we don't care about the dynamics on shorter length scales than this. If you keep track of where all these factors of L have gone, in this final expression, they all cancel. So we get an L-independent formula for the diffusion constant, uh, which is probably not so amenable to numerical simulations, but is at least you know, an honest prediction of what the diffusion constant is. Now, you can see that if you keep Taylor expanding this equation in powers of KL, all of the higher order effects will come with extra powers of L. This tells you that these are unphysical predictions uh, of our approximation. You have to throw all of these terms out. They will spoil any prediction that you would like to make. Now, also observe that all of these higher order terms will come with positive powers of L. L was a big parameter, so this means that the higher derivative corrections are actually more important our framework than they are in the true hydrodynamic description. You can essentially understand this fact that because we've integrated out all of the physics at length scale L, there are actually hydrodynamic modes in the system that we've integrated out, and they will start spoiling uh, the, our effective diffusion equation at whatever time scale they decay at, which is precisely uh, how you end up with these powers of L here. Okay. So the next simplest thing we can do is ask what happens if you have two excitations in your system. So I want to emphasize that when you're looking at this sector, okay, you're not talking about, like, do I have some energy here and some energy here? Okay, that's not true. Yeah? Sure. No. In the large L limit, all of the L dependence drops out. I mean, there will be s corrections in like mean free path divided by L. But yeah, they all drop out at the end. This is why I said, I mean, this is a physical prediction of our formalism. OK. OK, so in this two excitation sector, uh, you can't think of of having two excitations as the statement that you have a little bit of energy here and a little bit of average energy somewhere else. That's a linear combination of the previous sector. This is instead the statement that you have thermal averages everywhere, but correlations between sites X and Y. Okay? And you can ask how this perturbation moves. Now, because our transition matrix really only cares about local information, the moment that these two um, arrows, if you will, move more than one side apart from each other, they're completely independent. Okay? So up to you know, a very small fraction of all of the sites, the transition rates are identical to what you would have predicted if you said these are independent, non-interacting excitations. And if I put this in more physical terms, it means that if I give you this two-point function and take its time derivative in some state, then generically at late times, I will be able to write uh, the time evolution of this correlator as a diffusion equation for, for each particle separately. 
and you can carry this on all the way until you have square root of capital N perturbations. That's if you have capital N regions, basically square root of them can have an excitation. And if, if that's the number of fluctuations that you have, it turns out that this inequality, or, or this approximate equality, uh, okay? And this is uh, what you might call cluster decomposition. Now, the way I would think about this is that if I start with an op, okay, let me give you uh, the following picture, which is why I, I sort of went through this whole exercise. Um, so you might ask, you know, well, in your derivation, haven't you just assumed that, that the energy density was the only hydrodynamic degree of freedom? And then I was sort of saying that this was an unfortunate aspect of the canonical lore was that that had to be an assumption. So I now want to argue that in some sense I can do a little better than just asserting that the energy density is the only hydrodynamic mode. I can explicitly show you that there's another class of modes which you might have considered to be dangerous, namely things like energy density cubed integrated over some spatial region. This is not a hydrodynamic degree of freedom. Okay? It has the same physics in it as the original energy density. The way you see that in this framework is that if you put three hydrodynamic excitations on a single site, then generically at late times they will split apart into three correlated single excitations that then random walk independently via cluster decomposition. Okay? And so just like in, in ordinary kinetic theory, uh, what's happening here is simply that these hydrodynamic modes, uh, you can multiply them together, but effectively they will just refactorize again this is why only a, you know, order n degrees of freedom can keep track of the full exponential information in our joint probability. Okay, now if you want to go a little farther away from thermal equilibrium and talk about really, you know, large amplitude effects where the full nonlinearity in this noisy diffusion equation becomes important, uh, it's not as clear to do the calculation, we're, we're not um, as able to do the calculation quite as explicitly, but we can still argue that essentially the way you should think about uh, large amplitude effects is the following. If I'm in, if I'm close to thermal equilibrium, I, I talked about this Hermite basis of fluctuations, but in analogy with the classical or with the quantum os harmonic oscillator, you might as well switch to a coherent basis, uh, which is a little more natural, okay? Now in thermal equilibrium, or close to thermal equilibrium, turns out that in the coherent basis, you can remove the stochastic terms entirely, okay? So es essentially, the coherent approximation keeps track of all of the thermal fluctuations of the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And this is an overcomplete basis, at least, you know, near thermal equilibrium, so this is, a, is something we can do. Now we argue that even when you're very far from thermal equilibrium, you should continue to work in this overcomplete basis, and it's, by understanding the evolution of both beta of X and T, the local inverse temperature, together with all of the coefficients that you have to put out in front here because you have to specify you know, which betas you use, uh, and you can put linear c combinations of these states together. Okay? If you analyze the, the Fokker-Planck equation in this basis, it will be simple, even at the fully nonlinear level. Okay? And the punchline of, of this uh, calculation is essentially that the thermal density matrix, a local thermal density matrix, a state that is started out in essentially a tensor product thermal density matrix, E to the minus beta of X, E of X, this is the unique state that doesn't generate long range classical correlations at late times, okay? So this is maybe uh, a new perspective on why these um, Gibbs ensemble type states are so special, okay? All right, uh, the last point that I'll make is just that, you know, where does entropy production come from in this whole program? So because I'm claiming to derive hydrodynamics from unitary quantum dynamics, I have to tell you where entropy is coming from because entropy production is a crucial part of the sort of canonical theory of hydrodynamics. And it's actually sort of tautological to see where it comes from um, in this frame. So what happened is that we took our density matrix and we projected out all of the off-diagonal information 
And when you do that, you always end up with a density matrix that has more entropy. Okay? How much entropy you have turns out to be dominated entirely by the thermodynamic part. Okay? So there's a sort of Shannon entropy associated with your joint probability that's very subleading in 1 over L. We don't care about it. Okay? To leading order, you just have thermodynamic entropy. And using uh, the first law of thermodynamics, you can derive uh, this formula for the entropy production rate in our model, which is precisely uh, what Landau set it to be. Okay. All right. So let me uh, let me conclude the talk. So we su uh, so we derived at least non non rigorously uh, the nonlinear stochastic hydrodynamic equation uh, for energy diffusion starting from this unitary quantum evolution. And the key point is uh, to first project out all of the sort of superfluous information on the off-diagonal elements of the density matrix, and then to simplify uh, and reinterpret this Markov process as just the Fokker-Planck equation for the diffusion equation. Okay? You know, maybe this point is, uh, is obvious, but, but to us, I think it was nice to see that uh, we simply justify that, you know, a lot of modes that might have been hydrodynamic are not. You really only have energy diffusion, and uh, I think we can also give some insight into why we like to work with Gibbs ensembles and, and why they're a sort of special choice of initial condition. Uh, one thing which I hope that this may help to do in the long run, although I'm not going to make any promises, is to help develop better algorithms to calculate diffusion constants in chaotic models. The logic is simply that if you have a clear understanding of where the hydrodynamic modes are in your Hilbert space, uh, perhaps you can do a better job either isolating them or throwing them away, depending on the task that you wish to achieve. All right, so with that, I'm done. Thanks. Can we implement?